Hi, everyone, and welcome back to Applied International Economic Policy. This is our eighth topic of the course. Today, we're going to be discussing the climate crisis, what it means um, for the economy of the globe and specific regions in, in particular. Um, of course, so far in this course, we have taken the economy as some sort of uh, uh, system distinct and removed from the environment, which is a massive simplification, which especially when we look at this issue, which is one of the most pressing of our time, um, does, no, does us no favors whatsoever. So now we have to take a step back and consider the relation um, or the embeddedness of, of the environment, uh, of the economy in the environment. And that's what we're going to do today. So the structure of this lecture is as follows. We'll begin with some data on the climate crisis, um, and then we'll move on to why there has been a failure to um, effectively do anything about climate change for decades now. Um, we'll then look at some of the effects of the climate crisis, especially first without any government uh, uh, intervention. And then in the fourth and final section, we'll, we'll think about, well, what can we do uh, from a policy perspective to effectively combat climate change? Okay, so let's start with that data. Here we have the average temperature around the world from 1850 to today, um, where we have the anomaly expressed as a difference for, um, from, let's say, now uh, uh, until, well, from, from the average between 1961 to now, or whatever year you're looking at. Um, and clearly there is this very stark upward trend. Usually when we discuss average temperature um, difference or anomaly, it's to pre-industrial times, not necessarily 1960 and 1990. But uh, if we look, you know, back to 1850, uh, we see between 1850 and now it is an, uh, a difference of around 1.2 degrees Celsius around the world. Um, and that's more or less, you know, what we, what we see in terms of a difference between pre-industrial and modern times, even if 1850 isn't exactly pre-industrial. Anyway, so we see the stark increase in global temperatures. At the same time, of course, the leading, uh, the, the, the um, explanation for this is that uh, CO2 emissions have uh, greatly in, uh, increased in recent centuries. And what we see here is uh, measures of the atmospheric CO2 concentration around the world from, um, well, from most of history here, actually, because we're going uh, 500 years before uh, the common era. And we see around, well, the Industrial Revolution, um, that massive uptick in CO2. Uh, so, you know, clearly we see the correlation before even going into any of the theory as to why. If we look at, oh, if we look at this over a greater time scale, an epic time scale, if you like, we see how anomalous, how bizarre in some sense, um, this, this uptake in CO2 is. Um, and clearly is strongly related to, is caused by um, the sort of industrial revolution and, and um, the organization of uh, economic production since essentially um, yeah, the dawn of the industrial revolution. So, so far we've focused on CO2. Of course, there are other greenhouse gases that are just as um, dangerous, if not more so, in fact, for example, here we have sulfur hexafluoride, which is has 23,500 times the uh, global warming potential of CO2. Yeah, so they're all in relative scale here. So that means over the scale of 100 years, we could expect the warming effect on the globe of uh, uh, sulfur hexafluoride um, to be you know, much, much greater than the same amounts of uh, carbon dioxide. So um, clearly, you know, it's not all about carbon dioxide. In fact, some of these are much more dangerous. Uh, we have methane here as well, uh, which of course is related to our, you know, keeping and rearing of, of animals. Um, so the question is, you know, why the focus on CO2 if it's not necessarily the most um, potentially dangerous of them all? Well, of course, it's because it's the most prevalent um, 
here we have data for the US for 2018, but we see a similar sort of breakdown in other countries. And carbon dioxide is by far, you know, the greatest, um, uh, the, the greenhouse gas and greatest quantity in the atmosphere as it stands. So, you know, when it comes to explaining why the climate crisis is happening, why the climate change is occurring, um, you know, we have the natural factors and the the human-caused or anthropogenic factors. Um, and here I found is quite neat. This is from uh, the website carbonbrief.org, uh, who have some great um, explainers on the topic. And um, what we see here is, is the various factors and how they contribute in a simple model. Some models are much more complicated than this. Um, but in this simple model, you see the various ways in which uh, the different factors uh, influence changes in the global uh, temperature. So we have what are called the forcings on the temperature. So greenhouse gases clearly have a strong positive effect. Um, and aerosols, on the other hand, have a negative effect. And then we have some of the natural ones after land use, like ozone, uh, the ozone layer, and how, you know, how, it, uh, how, it, how it affects global temperatures. We have solar, uh, solar activity and volcanic activity. And, Essentially, what we see is when we combine these different um, forces on or forcings on the um, on global temperatures, they all add up when we combine these different lines to this total uh, predictive um, line, which does a pretty damn good job at explaining the observed temperatures that we see over time with you know small deviations from the line, right? And this goes back to 1850. So. Even, you know, a relatively simple model does a pretty damn good job of explaining um, and predicting the changes in the global temperature, um, you know, which is all very much in support of the strongly held consensus that, um, you know, climate change is driven by human activity, in particular, this um, massively upward trending line of, um, of greenhouse gases that are emitted by true human activity. So, what is the great danger with climate change? Well, in, in effect, it's the, the point at which we no longer are in control over our effects on the climate. Um, so, this is in some sense a kind of point of no return. After you trigger enough um, of these feedback effects, you no longer can influence the direction in which you know, the, the change in temperature of the earth uh, goes, right? And I'm sure many of you will, you know, be well-versed uh, in, in this sort of theory from school. And in case you're not, let's just briefly go over some of it. So the idea is simply that from agriculture, you know, and uh, our um, uh, efforts to uh, cut down so many of the world's um, forests and so on, uh, and with our use of fossil fuels, we create these greenhouse gases, which, you know, leads to uh, the acidification of the ocean, but in particular for our purposes, leads to global warming and climate change. Now, this will have immediate effects on the environment, but will, and one of those effects will be to reduce the cover of snow uh, and ice, and that snow and ice would otherwise function to reflect sunlight coming in uh, to the Earth, back out into space, and with less of that, um, less of that reflective uh, surface, uh, we would expect the Earth to warm up even further. Um, another feedback effect is, you know, how water evaporates, and so we have more of that vapor in the atmosphere. And in fact, when the permafrost, uh, you know, um, say in Russia and in the Arctic Circle, uh, Arctic Circle melts, then it releases all the methane that has trapped had been trapped underneath that permafrost for you know a, over long time periods. Um, and with each feedback effect, it only serves to increase the amount of greenhouse gas in the atmosphere, further driving global warming. Uh, even, we don't have it here, but um, with Australia, at the beginning of the year, we had that, those terrible um, forest fires, and these wildfires are occurring, of course, much more frequently, leading to the release of more CO2. Again, a different kind of feedback mechanism back to, greenhouse uh, back to the total quantity of greenhouse gases driving global warming. So... That is the, the sort of uh, most dangerous possibility with climate change is that at a certain point we hit too many of these feedback triggers and it just leads to this uh, runaway feedback mechanism uh, 
uh, where we, you know, the, the, the earth warms up and there's nothing we can even do about it anymore. Um, of course, this will destroy our environments. We're already destroying it. So it will only further lead to the retreat of glaciers and, and you know, destruction of uh, animals' habitats and depletion of corals and so on. But we will also be shooting ourselves in the foot, of course, because we'll be forcing uh, people to migrate away from their, their homes and their homelands. Um, we'll be flooding our own cities and, and farmlands and uh, leading to increased number of crop failures and famines and so on. So this is the, the root of the problem, if you like. Simplify it as much as I can, I guess. So how much time do we have before we uh, enter this runaway feedback mechanism sort of stage? Um, various uh, studies have tried to quantify how much of a carbon budget we have left. How much carbon can we, or CO2 can we emit, or CO2 equivalent, can we emit into the atmosphere um, and still, you know, not trigger um, this runaway climate change mechanism? Uh, and the various studies that are summarized, again, on the Carbon Brief websites um, that look at, you know, the remaining carbon budget we would have for a chance of, uh, a 66% chance of not inducing a one5 degree Celsius warming, which is kind of broadly considered to lead to this uh, hothouse runaway climate change scenario. Uh, well, the various um, studies, of course, there's some disagreement depending on exactly what model you use and, and so on. But let's say, you know, just very broadly, for our purposes, there's some average around 500 gigatons of CO2 left that we can use. Um, you know, sort of business as usual scenario before we trigger this runaway climate change scenario. Now, how much is 500 gigatons of CO2? Well, it's about 10 years of our current business as usual approach to running the global economy. Yeah. So given that most, most of these um, um, studies were conducted around, it seems, 2018, you know, that would mean we've got until 2028 before we... Uh, tip the world over. We go past one of these tipping points and it's all a bit too late. So the urgency is really emphasized by a lot of these studies and the science on the matter. What is, oh, what has the policy response been? Well, we have different scenarios that are mapped out here. Um, so this is from the Climate Action Tracker, but the graph is from Our World and Data, which of course uh, one of the sites I use most, especially in, in this presentation, actually, because they have some great data um, on the matter of climate change and the climate crisis. So with no climate pol policies, of course, we expect a continuation of the historic trend, perhaps a worsening of the historic trend because of those feedback mechanisms and so on. Um, under the current policies, we're looking at an increase in temperature of 3.1 to 3.7. Now, this is around a doubling of what scientists typically tend to agree is, um, you know, the, the limit to how much global warming we can allow before uh, this runaway scenario. Under the pledges that uh, governments around the world have put forward, according to the Climate Action Tracker, we could expect some, somewhere in the range of 2.6 to 3.2. But, you know, the, the, the safe or the, the, the pathways considered largely safe are just still so far off. So despite being years, not decades, but years away from a, a, a fairly catastrophic potential future, we are still quite a ways off, under our, not even under our current policies and action, but our current pledges, um, which of course may be um, reneged on. So there's a lot of um, policy still to be enacted and a lot more work to be done. Which leads to the question, given the costs associated with climate change and the quite frankly catastrophic um, potential of, of, of the climate crisis, why have we dithered and delayed? As, you know, it's not as if we only found about, out about this yesterday. In fact, you know, it goes back decades and decades as we will see. So why have um, policymakers failed 
to address this matter. Um, so here we're going to look at the, some of the political economy aspects, and here we you know, really take into consideration um, the, the, the motives of, um, of politicians, but also the power of, of different actors in the economy. So often when it comes to these negotiations around, you know, in the, in the UN, um, we have the argument, well, who is emitting the, the most CO2? And so typically America will say, well, China is emitting so much um, CO2, or, you know, here we have evidence of that, that currently China is the biggest emitter in terms of CO2 around the world. 27% of all global emissions come from China alone. So, you know, the US and uh, related economies, uh, policymakers can argue, okay, well, uh, it's up to China to um, put in place the most, uh, let's say, finance for any climate change action that is necessary. But of course, that's already a ridiculous simplification given the size of China in terms of its population. So if we look at, you know, the, the tons of uh, CO2 uh, per capita, so on a per person basis, we see that in China it's around seven tons per capita, whereas in the United States it's more than double that. Or let's say Australia, it's also extremely high, and, and Canada. Um, Europe isn't exactly a saint either, Germany in particular, compared to even China is doing better on a per capita basis. So exactly how we measure the, um, um, the burden that each country has, has put on the environment that really shifts the idea of who is responsible. And that can really affect negotiations on the international stage between how much each country should put into climate change action. And it delayed a lot of the action for many years. Of course, we can also look historically as we should because it's um, these greenhouse gases can stay in the atmosphere sometimes for thousands of years, uh, depending on the exact greenhouse gas. So, you know, uh, it's not just about who's emitting most today. And of course, it should come as no surprise that China then suddenly is not as relevant in this great debate. Um, the US and, you know, our own countries here in Europe, um, the EU as a whole, you know, are almost equal, right? 25% and 22% of all cumulative uh, CO2 emissions around the world come from the US and the uh, EU. So that again shifts the idea of responsibility somewhat more um, and shakes or shapes up the, the negotiations that take place. Part of the, the tragedy, if you like, is that um, the, the effects of climate change are most likely to be felt most by the poor who live, you know, perhaps already um, uh, in vulnerable parts of the economy, um, who are more reliant on um, uh, the, you know, the agriculture that is so dependent on the weather or, or on fish, which are, you know, um, perhaps in depleting um, numbers and so on. And um, here we just kind of see on uh, see the the uh, addition to cumulative greenhouse gases based on the income group. So here we would largely have the OECD, um, and here we might have some, um, some other European economies and maybe some emerging economies here, you know, very roughly speaking. And what we see is, perhaps unsurprisingly, that only 16% of the population are, are responsible for 38% of global CO2 emissions. So there's, and, and go one, one step down, so the upper middle income countries 51% of the population are then accountable for 86% of global CO2. So half the population of the world is responsible for um, the vast, vast majority of global CO2 emissions. And of course, it's the same countries that have the most ability to effectively combat climate change. So if we take away the idea about who's responsible and just ask who is um, able, who is capable of action, there's an obvious there's an obvious answer and it happens to also tie in with the uh, a question of well, who is responsible so there is in some sense uh, a very strong arguments put, put forward that is those with the broader shoulders should uh, take on the biggest burden especially if they cause the majority of that burden 
for these low-income countries. What has also provoked delay and dithering amongst um, negotiators around the world is, well, how exactly do you measure CO2? Is it based on where the products causing the CO2 are consumed or where the products are produced? Now, of course, if you look at production where it's produced, as is often the case in some of these statistics, or the, the, the statistics we've seen, then production values really inflates China's um, um, share of global CO2 emissions. Whereas if it's based on consumption, then of course, um, yeah, that will inflate the US and Europe's um, share of CO2 emissions, of, of course, because we are here in Europe, apart from Germany perhaps, um, largely importing economies uh, and importing those goods coming out of China and um, Southeast Asia and so on. So that can also you know, be a way in which the debate gets muddied. Um, and then we just have the simple fact that, well, not all economies, not all countries will be affected the same way. So, you know, clearly those countries that have oil are so dependent on oil are likely to thwart and um, delay effective action for obvious reasons. And then for perhaps less obvious reasons, um, you, know, you have some economies that uh, with the rise in global temperatures, uh, could see their perma or will see their permafrost thaw, leading to more arable land for farming and so on. Um, and so, you know, the, even in some of the debates, you see the idea that those countries should be compensated um, if they are to take part in any CO two emissions. So, if we're talking cold hard cash and business and not morality and so on, this kind of becomes the debate that is had. So, you know, obviously the consequences are very important and those are very much asymmetric. The Maldives will sink, the world's forests will burn um, at the same time as these, these particular economies may actually uh, benefit, uh, at least on some time scale, from the change to the climate. So this is really, um, yeah, slow down any uh, action on the world stage. Moreover, of course, those corporations most um, involved with uh, fossil fuels and the expulsion of carbon into the atmosphere have spent much of their resources ensuring or trying to ensure that no uh, effective action comes into place. So that really is the political economy aspect here. With the accumula accumulation of wealth comes the accumulation of power. And how is power exercised? In modern economies, well, it's often done through lobbying. And even in what year is this? I think 2019, we still see, even with the public relations uh, pledges from these economies that they are you know, um, investing in renewable technologies and so on, there's still a certain amount, quite a higher amount, spent on lobbying uh, governments to ensure that um, oil and gas and coal remain um, relevant and the basis of our um, modern economies. More than lobbying, there is of the simple fact that some of these corporations in particular engage directly with the public opinion, with a public opinion, uh, in sowing disinformation. A particularly interesting case um, in this regard is from ExxonMobil, one of the world's largest uh, oil corporations. Unfortunately, it's uh, yeah, not so easy to see, but essentially what we have here on the left-hand side over here are internal documents from Exxon, from scientific advisors dating back to the 1970s that show that Exxon was very much aware of the fact that, they, um, that, that, that uh, oil uh, and, and uh, gas were, uh, and CO2 emissions were responsible for the increase in warming. Um, to quote, it is distinctly possible that the scenario analyzed here will later produce efforts which will indeed be catastrophic, in parentheses, at least for a substantial fraction of the Earth's population. So this was uh, 1981, where this memo was passed on to senior management from scientific advisors. Um, here in a, in a presentation made to such uh, uh, higher ups, you have um, the summary in the presentation saying prevailing opinion in the scientific consensus, attribute CO2 increase to fossil fuel consumption, and doubling CO2 could increase average global temperatures one 
to three degrees Celsius by 20, uh, I think that's 2050. Yeah. So, which is actually remarkably accurate for something that was uh, in 1978. At the same time, given this information that they had, this knowledge that they had internally, externally, um, ExxonMobil in particular, regularly bought uh, adverts which look uh, more like an opinion piece on editorial, um, so hence the name advertorials in the New York Times between 1989 and 2010, expressing and sowing the seeds of doubt in the science backing climate change, which you can, I mean, you can't really read it here, but from the, from the titles alone, um, you can see that that's what it's trying to do. Um, the graph here is basically showing the, the average sea temperatures in a particular region and trying to say that, yeah, uh, the earth isn't actually warming up or at least it's not fully settled and so on. And just to pull some quotes from those advertorials in particular, um, a 1997 ad says, let's face it, this, the science of climate change is too uncertain to mandate a plan of action that could plunge economies into turmoil. Uh, or in 2000, they said, it is impossible for scientists to attribute the recent small surface temperature increase to human activity. So here we see the effects of disinformation on top of lobbying, on top of the failures of, of, of governments and economy, uh, yeah, um, yeah, countries to come together on the international stage to share the responsibility rather than finger point and so on, which has led to a remarkable lack of concerted action uh, over the decades since it was first known that uh, higher levels of CO2 lead to higher temperatures. Okay, so that's where we're at now. There has been a greater, of course, acceptance of climate change and the drivers of climate change in the public opinion in recent times. Um, so there is more action taking place in some sense. Um, what we're going to do in the next parts of this video uh, lecture is look at the effects uh, of, of, climate, of the climate crisis and then talk a little bit about what still needs to be done. So um, I'll pause it here and then uh, we'll uh, continue in the next video with those topics. All right, see you in the next video.